Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to be talking about autism and food issues. So let me start by stating the obvious. I'm going to be talking about food and diet and habits and for those of you who are suffering with eating disorders or in recovery this might be triggering even though I'm not going to talk too much about eating disorders specifically. So for people who've known me since I was a child this is not going to be surprising but for those of you who've known me when I'm an adult uh, you might be surprised to learn that up until the age of about 12 I was a monumentally fussy eater and from about 12 to 18 I was more like a mainstream fussy eater and this went on until I was about 18 or 19 and in, I discovered the world of food as it were or the world of eating. Now during my 20s I was diagnosed with celiac disease and PCOS so the way that I eat now is restricted for health issues but if it weren't for those factors I could pretty much eat anything now without, you know, gagging in revulsion. I would not consider myself a fussy or a picky eater at all anymore. However, 20, 30 years ago was a different story. I spoke to my mum about this. Um, surprisingly enough, in the 80s, she was not keeping records of what I ate. Um, but I know that she said that she weaned me as normal and I ate all foods as normal. And I think it was probably around the ages of three or four, although she doesn't really know. But so let's say it started around three or four and went on until 12. I know that my mum worried a lot about my eating and how little I would eat and how little variety I would eat. But I'll tell you the kinds of things that, that I would eat at the time. Breakfast, Cocoa Pops, any other sweet cereal, followed by toast with Nutella on it, maybe a glass of milk. Now my school at the time had really, really grim lunches. And um, I mean, this was everybody thought this, not just the really, really fussy people. But funnily enough, they wouldn't allow packed lunches unless you had a food allergy. And I didn't know at the time that I did. So um, I basically ate very little all day. And then my mum would bring me a packed lunch when I got out of school at 3.30 or 4 or whatever. So the packed lunch would normally consist of some sandwiches, white bread, no butter, and then maybe ham in them. But the ham had to be processed. It was not allowed to be like, you know, it came from a pig. It had to be like processed. So it had this very specific texture and no like fat marbling or anything like that. So it would be just white, soft white bread with ham in the middle, no butter. And then the other category of sandwich would be either the same white bread with peanut butter in it or with Nutella in it. So you can see Nutella made up quite a large portion of my uh, diet. I was quite a Nutella fanatic and we would keep all those cups, you know, they used to put them in cups that you could use and had little cartoon characters and we had shelves of them. Um, so Nutella was my childhood. Yeah, comment down below if you remember those cool Nutella glasses. I don't think I'm the only autistic person who was obsessed. So along with the sandwiches, I would have usually a chocolate bar, a chocolate biscuit of some kind, a bag of crisps, I don't remember exactly what flavors, probably smoky bacon or prawn cocktail. No vinegar, ready salted at a pinch, definitely no cheese and onion. So yeah, pretty much two flavors of crisps. I would have an apple that you might notice this is my first uh, actual piece of real food, but I would only eat Granny Smith apples and only Granny Smith apples that were a particular size because once they grow bigger, they get fluffier and the texture and the taste changes. So the little ones are really like, not just sweet, but also quite acidic and tart. And so that was, that was the only fruit that I would eat. Like I would not, I wouldn't eat golden delicious apple. I wouldn't, I might, you know, bite a little bit off if I was forced to. So <laughs> That was my fresh fruit and vegetable intake. And drinks wise, I would not drink any fizzy drinks at all. I would drink apple juice, uh, not cloudy. I would drink Ambongo, who else remembers that? And I would drink like Robinson's squash and things like that. So that was lunch. <laughs> and then dinner, I would probably snack on like, crisps, maybe some hula hoops or something like that, or more chocolate. And then dinner, I did eat meat, but it couldn't have any fat on it. So, and it couldn't have any sauce on it either. So I would eat things like plain chicken or steak or lamb chops. I actually would eat meat, but the meat just couldn't be a fatty cut. And with that, I would probably eat some processed potato based thing like chips or alpha bites or potato waffles, um, but I wouldn't actually eat potatoes, potatoes. Vegetable wise, yeah, it was cucumber. 
that was it. Maybe sometimes when I got a little bit older, I would eat raw carrots, but basically just cucumber. I uh, wouldn't eat tomatoes, wouldn't eat, no, I literally did not eat any vegetables and I'm still alive. <laughs> Uh, what else would I eat for dinner? I would definitely eat any kind of processed meat food which was breaded like chicken nuggets or fish fingers or something like that. And I would have white rice or plain pasta. I really don't know how my mum dealt with all of this. Uh, if that was happening to my child I would probably be tearing my hair out but my mum just wanted me to eat food and I understand that, you know. Um, None of this, like, I'm gonna blend this into this sauce because I wouldn't eat any sauce. You couldn't, <laughs> couldn't lie to me about what my food was. I had my very particular things. And I think lying to me about food would have made me just distrust the whole thing a lot more. So yeah, I had a very sweet tooth and aversion to most savory things and most nutritious things. Um, I can't remember if I ate eggs. I think at some point I did start eating scrambled eggs. But this was back in the 80s when everybody believed that eggs were bad for you. So it wasn't like, oh, you should eat more eggs because they're nutritious. It's like, don't eat too many eggs because you'll get high cholesterol, which we now know is not true. So really, I, I ate a lot of sugar and refined carbs. I would eat ice cream, chocolate bars, cakes, but I wouldn't eat anything that was derived from fruit. So if the cake had jam in it, that was a no-go. If the cake had cream in the middle, no, I wouldn't eat cream. I wouldn't eat anything that was wine gums uh, or, you know, sweets like that. So I, I had a sweet tooth, but if it was flavored like fruit or if it was like, you know, chewy, I think ice cream chewits were the closest I got to that kind of texture. And ice cream, obviously there's chocolate, vanilla, caramel, but uh, any flavor derived from fruit, that's a no-go as well. I wouldn't even eat pizza as a child. I would pick off, the, I would happily pick off the pepperoni. I would maybe eat the crusts on the outside, but I would not touch the actual pizza pass part because it was made from tomatoes and sauce and cheese, which were three of my, um, arch nemeses at the time. And you know, talking to talking about this, I am surprised that I even made it to five foot four with celiac disease because so much of what I ate was gluten based. I am also surprised that I didn't drive my mother completely nuts. But I am glad that she fed me instead of taking the, oh, you'll eat when you're hungry approach because I just don't think I would have. I preferred to go hungry than to eat things that gave me this repulsive reaction. Now the funny thing is, my mum is actually a really good cook. It wasn't like we were all just being served chicken nuggets the whole time. She really tried to get me to eat nutritious food. You know, she would make these casseroles and all these things. Um, and so the rest of the family would eat these and she would end up cooking me something separately because I wouldn't eat what the rest of the family were eating. Um, so it wasn't really lack of trying on that, on that part anyway, but I'm really glad that it didn't turn into psychological warfare because I think with autistic people, you just are not gonna win. Their reasons for not wanting to do something, our reasons for not wanting to eat something are not just, we're being naughty, we're being bad. It's like, this thing is giving me a physical reaction. And I also, I'm not about to change because somebody else tells me to change. My interest in food came about very organically and it was around when I was 18 or 19. Just suddenly thought, Hey, I can try this. I moved, I moved out of how, oh, I moved out of house. I moved out of home and so I was cooking for myself a lot more and it was like a gradual kind of introduction to new things and it wasn't stressful like that. It wasn't being imposed on me by teachers. Now you might ask, what was it about all this food that I actually didn't like? Well, for most of the food in question, it was the texture. Um, and I think that is very common for autistic people. It's not necessarily the flavor of something, but how it feels in your mouth. The, the thought of eating it, would it would have such a physical reaction that I would sort of, it would give me the shivers, so I would get goosebumps on my arms and I would sort of gag, even from the smell of something, even though a smell wasn't a texture, but it would remind me of a texture. I mean, I have synesthesia, so there's a whole kind of confusing thing going on there and probably contributed to it because there were a lot of things that I'd never even tried that I refused to eat because I, had an association with maybe the smell or the look of it with a texture or a feeling, um, which sounds very strange. I don't even know if anyone else relates to this at all. Please do let me know that I'm not just talking rubbish right now. And, and also the problem was that at school, the cafeteria would smell disgusting. And so 
if I'd not tried something, I had these disgusting smells and then I would see them and so I would just associate th this food with terrible smell. That didn't help introducing me to more things in a controlled environment. You know, considering that it was a private school and we were paying good money, I assume, for this food, it was really dreadful and if you had, if you didn't want the hot option, you got the, the option of a salad and looking back on it, like the amount of nutrition even if you ate the whole plate, you would get one slice of ham, you know, a couple of slices of cucumber and a tomato and like some lettuce and a bread roll with some butter. And that's not, that's not a nutritious alternative to a hot food for any child, let alone somebody who will only eat the bread roll and the slice of ham. <laughs> and sometimes not even that. So I really think that the environment that I was introduced to food in was a huge contributor to my anxiety and disgust around food. Aside from the textural thing, I suppose this is also a bit textural, but um, I really didn't like sauces and sauces touching things and the kind of... wasn't really the texture in your mouth because you don't chew it, but it was like the sliminess of it. The sliminess on the food would sort of make me feel... and I still get that way if somebody gives you chips, although I don't really eat chips, but uh, you know, if you get a plate of chips and they've poured ketchup on it, I still, even though I will eat ketchup, I would much rather for it to be not all over my chips or all over anything else. So it's really like, um, so much of this is based on sensory aversions and kind of conditioning from the environment. And I got very stressed and anxious about food because of all of this, and I could see that I was different to other people. I could see that I was the fussiest of everyone, and I felt really self-conscious about it. And you know, I, I think I really could have done with a space to work out with these food issues in a sort of safe environment, but it wasn't going to be school. And to be honest, at home, you know, when, it, when it's breakfast time, you're getting ready for school, you don't really have time to kind of calmly experiment. And then when we get home, it was a very academic school, so I had a lot of homework even as a child. My mum was cooking dinner, and so there wasn't, there just wasn't that time or space that I might have needed to break out of this and sort of coax me into eating new things if a sort of slowly, slowly catchy monkey method might actually have helped. And I think this is why it was around the age of about 12 when I started gradually eating a couple more things, like real food things. A lot of the sensory issues in my childhood had also got better, you know, when I was about 12 I wasn't so bothered by things like scratchy sleeves and stuff like that. The sensory stuff had been had been a little fading away little by little. The food at my secondary school was a lot better and they had a self-serve element which meant you weren't at the mercy of the dinner ladies, you know, slopping food on your plate. So that really, really helped as well. But the problem is, still in school, is that everybody eats in cafeterias, uh, which is understandable as to why, because it contains the mess, but it is also a very stressful environment for an autistic person. They are loud and echoey. There are a lot of people all crammed together. There's the kind of social stuff. I remember getting very stressed at secondary school because it was like, who are you gonna sit with? Not really like a mean girls thing, but uh, you know, uh, so I would remember like timing, walking <laughs> from the queue to the table so that I wouldn't have to sit on a particular table and I could sit with some other people. Um, and that was all like, it all contributes. When you're trying to eat, you don't want to be stressed. And when I get stressed, my stomach kind of tenses up a little bit. So a, a slightly better environment would have been much more helpful to me. And I think probably would have uh, reduced the amount of food issues that I'd ended up having as a child. And it's, it's difficult to say what exactly changed. I think just growing up helped. The sensory, certain sensory issues got better. I started to be able to try things in my own space and time rather than having it imposed upon me because the teachers at my primary school were very um, rigid about this, you know. If you didn't finish your play, you would wait after lunch if you got the wrong teacher and you'd have a whole lecture about the starving children in Africa, which is pretty much the worst thing that you can say to an already very sensitive child is make them feel more guilt guilty, but it didn't make me eat the food. I mean, first of all, the starving children in Africa, that's not a problem of like, okay, that your food is here, we'll send it to them kind of thing. Um, but adding that extra layer of guilt, like, why aren't you eating? You're so lucky. Everybody else in the world is starving. Uh, that really doesn't work for me at all. And I hope that I will never utter those words, the starving children in Africa. Um, for a variety of reasons, they are problematic. 
Now, I don't know if anyone watching this maybe has children that are going through something similar to what I did, but the question I think that's important for me to try and reflect on is what could everybody have done differently to help me just eat? a wider variety of food. Diet is very important, but I don't think that I had my problems because I didn't eat vegetables. I think I was having problems because all I was eating was gluten. But I think the number one thing that would have helped me be less afraid of food back then was having an environment to do low pressure cooking and food experimentation. And what I mean by that is, I used to bake cookies and things like that with my mum, but there was no programs, no sort of programs back then where you could just feel things, smell things with no pressure to actually eat them. You would just say, okay, well, this is a bell pepper. Um, this is what it feels like. Let's cut it, see how it smells. It's got these seeds in it. We're touching all of this. Um, something like that, I think, that would have helped me um, without anyone saying, yeah, okay, try some now, try it, eat it. Um, <laughs> looking back now, this is not something that my mum could have possibly foreseen, but having the opportunity to try more umami kind of flavours would have helped because I was not so opposed to the flavours of food as I was to the texture of food. And I am a really big fan of really savoury umami flavours now. And so if I'd been kind of encouraged to pursue food along that line, it might have been something that would have led into me, you know, tolerating more sauces and things like that. Obviously it's hard to get flavour onto completely plain chicken or something like that without sauce. But I think if there was a way to sort of introduce me to food and make me feel less scared about everything, I think it would have been through that way. But at the end of the day, I didn't know I was autistic. I didn't know I had celiac disease. And so there were a lot of factors at play here and I don't really blame myself or anyone else. I just knew that it was a problem at the time. I think that also something that would have been really helpful would have been the times when I did want to try new food. If everybody could just completely ignore me and pretend it's not happening, that would be great. Because I remember there were a couple of times when I thought I will try a potato. So I'm like trying to very subtly try the potato without people looking at me or commenting. And I think it was probably my dad who said something like, oh look, Sam's trying a potato, woo! And um, that really, as a child, that would have been enough to make me just say, no, I'm not trying it now. I don't want to try it. I do not want people watching me and gauging my reactions while I'm trying to process something in a textural kind of way. Ignoring me completely is a great, would have been a great option. But you know, it's very easy to uh, look back and hindsight is always 2020, right? If not a little bit better. Now I know also that my diet could have been worse. I did eat a variety of some things. There are some autistic kids who will literally just eat one or two or, or three things. And that's it in terms of variety. And my mum kind of, um, oh, son. Um, my mum did the right thing. She gave me multivitamins, of course. That were, I was very particular about which ones I would eat. But I did have the multivitamins and once we got the ones with the right shape and the right texture. The thing is though, despite having such a restricted diet, I did grow in the end. And that was even with undiagnosed celiac disease and eating gluten. You know, I am 5'4", which is average height for women in the UK, maybe a little bit below average now, but I am way below average for my family. They're all like, you know, Nordic giants. But it's difficult to know whether that was caused by my diet or the fact that I had an autoimmune disease, um, that I wasn't absorbing really anything anyway, even with a multivitamin. So I think that if you are in a position where you have an autistic child who has very restricted diet or is very fussy. I am in no ways a child feeding expert. I have kept my child fed thus far for two years. Um, so I'm doing a pretty good job of that, but he's also not a fussy eater, which helps. But if you do have a fussy eater, my advice to you would be firstly to just dial down any source of stress when it comes to food, whether that is other people's comments, other people pressuring them, noisy, stressful food environments, this sort of thing. Oh, I forgot yet. Yeah, my school was a Christian school, which meant that before or after, I can't remember, the meal, we would be forced to say grace. And if you ever need me to go on a violent killing spree, that is my trigger word. <laughs> it's, you know, for what we're about to receive, may the Lord make us truly thankful. Oh, amen. And I'll just go nuts, I promise. Because 
adding to the noise of the cafeteria, the stress, the disgusting smells, the horrible food, me being actually hungry and not being able to eat the food, adding on religious indoctrination was just the cherry on top. So I would say, try and remove the stress before you focus on what the food issue is because uh, I was just so stressed and I still get stressed around food for different reasons now because I have celiac disease and everywhere you go there's breadcrumbs. Yeah, think about what kind of stress your child might have associated with, with food. I mean, maybe you have a very large family and so there's like a lot of noise at dinner time or something like that or they're eating in the cafeteria and there's a lot of noise. Maybe there are people sort of pressuring them to eat saying, oh well, you know, if you eat your broccoli, I'll give you some ice cream. And that's not a great tactic, I think, for any child because it shows them that one thing is something to be pushed through and tolerated and the other thing is a reward. And, you know, that's problematic in many ways. But also, I think, just experimenting with your child around food and just having these low pressure kind of food encounters either having your child help prepare food that they don't have to eat, but preparing it and getting used to how it feels and how it smells and the texture, not the, the horrible mushy peas uh, from the school, but like fresh crispy peas, that sort of thing. And patience as well. I mean, I had a pretty terrible diet as a child and I'm still here, okay, I have various health issues I don't necessarily think can be attributed to a poor diet, but I'm still here, I'm still alive, and I've got everything more or less <laughs> under control now. So I guess my take home message, if you are worried about your child, is just don't worry so much. And I know that's easy to say, there might be many reasons for you to worry about your child. You know, people flourish on all kinds of diets and in all situations, and I think we have become very culturally um, anxious about food and making sure have you got a complete wide variety of all the fruits and all the vegetables and all these things, and if you don't have a big variety it's gonna go wrong. You know, there are various indigenous tribes throughout the world who might eat one thing. There is a tribe in, um, I think, native to Ethiopia who just drink blood and goat's milk. People flourish in all ways, and so as parents, or even as your adult caregiver of yourself, I think we just need to be less anxious about things, you know? So let me know if this resonated with you at all down below. Um, I know that food is a very sensitive topic and it makes a lot of people very anxious, but I hope that this was helpful or enlightening or interesting or just it was something. You're still here, so I guess you uh, didn't click off yet. But if you do want to know more about autism and neurodiversity, I do have a whole playlist. So have a look in there and see if there's any other videos that you might be interested in. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next week. Bye.